Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to another Hangout with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Uh, my name is Joe Grabowski. For those who don't know, we're all about bringing the uh, science, adventure, and classroom, or classrooms, science, adventure, and conservation into classrooms uh, throughout North America and hopefully beyond. A um, little bit of a funny Hangout today. We've had a nice storm in Ontario, so a few classrooms can't make it, but hopefully they'll catch the YouTube tomorrow, so I'll probably give a shout out to them um, when they are able to catch the YouTube. But we do have some classrooms joining us today. Um, I'll give them a quick little intro. We have Mrs. Cassidy's group from Deseronto, Ontario. So grades three through eight joining us yeah. right now. You guys want to give a wave to the camera? There we go. Awesome. We have Mrs. McMahon's group joining us from uh, Long Lac, Ontario. They're grades six, seven, and eight from Marjorie Public School. And they're probably going to join us through some questions later via email. And then Mrs. Sefcik's group from Weatherford, Texas. All right. And to get to our guest, who's used to tackling weather like this and far, far worse, uh, far worse, we have George Karunas. He's a renowned global adventurer, storm chaser, explorer, and television presenter of the show Angry Planet. And his pursuit to document the power of our planet and nature's worst weather conditions have taken him all over the globe. So he has the distinction of being the first person to film from inside of three of the world's most fearsome forces, inside a tornado, the eye of a hurricane, and inside an active volcano. And his travels have taken him to places like kayaking in Antarctica with whales, experiencing a zero-gravity flight, and uh, trekking to visit mountain gorillas in Rwanda. And that just barely scratches the surface. So today he'll be sharing his recent adventure to Niira Gongo, a volcano in the African Congo. So, George, thanks so much for not letting the weather defeat you today and joining us. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Joe. And you got the pronunciation of Niragongo quite uh, quite spot on there. Yeah, we got a pretty major uh, ice storm here in Toronto today. So, uh, especially you guys in Deseronto, thanks for uh, being able to keep the schools open and everything. I don't know how bad it is there, but it's pretty bad here. So. Anyway, I'm not allowed to uh, cancel anything because of the weather, because I chase storms all over the world, and I climb inside volcanoes and basically document the most extreme places on the planet. One of the things that I frequently do is assist scientists. I'm not a scientist myself. My educational background is in engineering, but what I do is I specialize in travel to the most dangerous places. Sometimes it's in the eye of a hurricane. Sometimes it's inside an active volcano. Sometimes it's chasing tornadoes near Weatherford, Texas, as a matter of fact. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there's a, a, a lot of opportunity for me to assist scientists. And that's exactly what I did recently, just last month, in a place called Niragongo. It's a volcano in Central Africa in a country called the Democratic Republic of Congo. And let me just uh, pull up some pics here for you. Show you what this is all about. Whoops. That's not what I want. Yes, it is what I want. Can you guys see that map? We can see it. Awesome. That's full screen now? Uh, it's still the kind of presentation mode. Oh, I see. Yeah. How's that? You know what? I think it's the way I've got this shared. Stand by. Yeah, choose um, a full screen. desktop. That usually goes smoother. Sorry? Ch if choose? You, yeah, the first like... option to share the whole desktop. There we go. How's that? Now we're full screen. Perfect. Cool. So... The, the, the Democratic Republic of Congo, it's in the, the very middle of Africa. Not very many people visit this place. And right along the border with Rwanda, there is a national park called Virunga, Virunga National Park. And this place is very famous because it's one of the only places in the world where it is actually the only place in the world where you can see rare mountain gorillas. And these gorillas are so incredibly rare that there's only about uh, seven or eight hundred of them left in the world and I was there about ten years ago took these pictures of these gorillas it really is incredible to go and visit them and uh, and get so close to them that you literally have to step out of the way as the gorillas walk past you in the middle of the jungle it's really outstanding but this particular expedition that I just came back from has nothing to do with gorillas that's just why this particular park is also well known it's 
also home to a couple of very active volcanoes, including Niragongo. This volcano is it's massive. It's a huge volcano, extremely active, and inside there is a lake of lava. And there are only about four places, sorry, five places in the world where you can find these lakes of lava. And in my explorations, I've been fortunate enough to visit four out of those five. But this one is the biggest. The width of that pool of lava is about two football fields wide. So about 200 yards, 200 meters, give or take. It is massive. And it's constantly boiling away, just constantly churning. And so the purpose of this particular scientific expedition was to team up with the local volcanologists who don't have a lot of resources. They're, uh, they're, they're working with very basic tools and they don't really have the skills, the ability, the expertise to go down inside the volcano because it's too difficult and dangerous. But that's where I come in because that's sort of my specialty. So I teamed up with some colleagues from New Zealand and we partnered with the people from the, the scientists from the volcano observatory to go down inside this volcano and measure some of the gas, uh, do a bunch of different scientific measurements of this particular volcano. And it's important because it's very close to the city of Goma. About a million, just under a million people live in the shadow of this volcano. And as you can imagine, living, having your city right next to an active volcano kind of gets people's attention. It certainly uh, is something that they think about frequently because this volcano does have a reputation for occasionally erupting and, and, and sending lava flows down the side. The city itself sprawls for just miles and miles and miles. Lots of people there. Um, not a lot of infrastructure, so they, if there was a lava flow to come down from the volcano towards the city, they wouldn't have a lot of opportunity to defend the, 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 the city. And as a matter of fact, in 2002, the volcano did erupt and that lake of lava that you, that you saw drained and poured down the side of the volcano at close to highway speed, some of the fastest moving lava in the world because it's very uh, steep and also the uh, viscosity is very fluid lava. It's not very sticky. It's more like, uh, it runs more like water than it does like, uh, like syrup. So the lava flowed into the city, split the city in two buried these cars. You can see after the lava cools, it forms, turns into rock, of course, because lava is nothing more than molten rock. And this is some of the, the, some of the cars left behind that were burned by the lava, completely embedded in it, and they're still there many, many years later. The runway at the airport was cut in half by the, uh, by the lava and uh, had to be repaired. It was just this incredible, incredible mess. And, uh, of course, when you have so many people living in that city, it can uh, obviously cause some huge problems. One of the interesting things about this particular place that is unique to anywhere in the world is the lake that is nearby. This is Lake Kivu. This is a shot from the hotel that I was staying at just a couple of weeks ago. And when the lava poured out of the volcano in 2002, it poured into the lake. And that had a lot of people very concerned because this lake... Is one of only about three in the world that could actually explode. Now imagine, I'm sure you guys have seen the experiments where you take the Mentos and you put it in the bottle of Diet Coke and it all just explodes out, right? I'm sure you guys have seen that on Mythbusters or, or on the internet. Well, this that it, the reason that the Diet Coke does that is because it has a whole bunch of carbon dioxide gas that's in in the liquid. And when you put the Mentos in, it immediately comes out of solution and turns into that gas that then explodes and makes a huge mess. Well, this lake is filled with dissolved carbon dioxide, just like a bottle of, of Coke or Pepsi or whatever. And if there's enough of a disturbance, like a big earthquake or an underwater landslide or a volcano eruption, this lake could explode and send all of that carbon dioxide up into the air. That's exactly what happened about 30 years ago in the country of Cameroon, in, uh, also in Africa. There's a much smaller lake there called Lake Nios, and there was a disturbance at night. The lake exploded and basically burped out this cloud of carbon dioxide gas, and it settled along the shores of the lake. And unfortunately, we as humans 
we can't breathe carbon dioxide, so it's actually toxic and it killed many people, unfortunately. The concern here is that if the volcano has another big eruption, it could cause this lake to actually do that, that eruption. It's, it's called a limnic eruption or a lake overturn. And if that were to happen, there would be a lot of people at risk. There's a, about a million people living in Goma and about two million people in total that live around this lake. And it's about a thousand times bigger than the lake that exploded in, uh, in Cameroon. So not many people know that some lakes have the ability to explode. So there you go. There's the interesting fact of the day. Here we are in, uh, in Goma. I've teamed up at this point with the crew from the Volcano Observatory. When you're different, whenever you're doing a big scientific expedition, it takes a lot of uh, effort from a big team. We spent days in the city gathering supplies, food, water, getting our equipment all sorted and organized. And then we had to, of course, get all this stuff up to the volcano. There's an example of some of our pile of equipment. We do not travel light. It's not, uh, <laughs> it's not like taking a small plane where you uh, can put your stuff in the overhead compartment. We had uh, about 300 liters of water, uh, about a kilometer's worth of rope, which is uh, just massive, massive amounts of rope, food, more equipment, tents, you name it. Basically, it was about, uh, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds, probably close to a ton worth of equipment that we had to somehow get up to the summit of this volcano, which was up at... Uh, Oh, about 3,500 meters or 11,000 feet. So we had a, a bit of a, a deal with the United Nations. They told us that we could use their helicopters to bring all this equipment up for our scientific mission, which was great because, hey, who doesn't love flying around in helicopters? And uh, they were very, very gracious. The only problem was is that the weather was terrible the first day. We couldn't uh, even find a place to land. The second day, we try again. And it turns out that uh, you actually cannot land a helicopter at the top of this volcano because it's just so just too steep. So it wasn't possible. So we were kind of stuck. We, we weren't able to transport all of our equipment up the side of the volcano. There it is, as you see from, from the helicopter. Uh, the, st the sides are very, very steep, and there's no place to land a great big chopper like that. So we were kind of stuck. We had all kinds of problems. One of our teammates, uh, Mark Robinson from the Weather Network, you guys in, uh, in Canada here may have seen Mark Robinson on the Weather Network. He and I worked together very frequently. He got very sick uh, while we were waiting to try and uh, figure out what to do because of our helicopter problems. <laughs> it was just one one problem after another. Luckily, we had a good medic on board on the team. It's just one of those other little things you have to think about. And it's pretty common to get sick when we travel in Africa. I've been there many times, and I think I get sick every time that I'm there. But Mark was very, very sick. Eventually, though, he got better. And we finally had to make a decision, what are we going to do about getting all of this these ton this ton of equipment up to this summit of this volcano? Well, we did it the old-fashioned way, the hard way. We hired about 75 people from the nearby village to act as porters to help us carry everything up. So everything went up by hand. We ended up not using any of the helicopters whatsoever. And to give you an idea of how difficult this was, the hike takes about six hours in total on very steep, very loose volcanic rock. It took almost 20 people just to carry our water up to the top of the volcano. We were going to stay up there for about two weeks, and there's quite a few of us, so it takes a lot of water. Water is extremely heavy. So we uh, had no choice. We had to hire about 75 people to bring everything up with us. There you can see a couple of the porters carrying some, some items up through the jungle. Um, the trail sort of weaves in between uh, volcanic rock and dense jungle. The higher up you get, you the, the jungle starts to go away, and then it becomes nothing but this volcanic moonscape of rock. The entire time, we had to have armed security guards with us. The uh, Virunga National Park is a place that's known to have um, armed rebels. So it's very dangerous there. So we always, always had to have uh, guys with, uh, with uh, rifles, machine guns to help protect us in case we were to come across any, any uh, rebel activity that was there. So it's kind of a bit of a dangerous place to go visit, but uh, these guys are very good and they, they kept us very safe. And once we finally got to the top, this was our view. 
It is a massive, massive volcano. Uh, it's about ooh, just under a mile wide, about 1.3 kilometers, and about 500 meters deep, about 500 yards to get from the top down to the bottom where that lake of lava is. In the bright sunlight, it's kind of hard to tell that there's lava there, but it absolutely is. When it, uh, when it gets darker, you can really see the glow. And there's that plume of gas that's coming out. That's mainly, it's mainly uh, steam, but there's also sulfur dioxide gas in there, which is very uh, irritating to the eyes. If you if you strike a match, you smell that sulfur smell. That's basically the same gas, and it burns your eyes and it stings your nose, and basically it turns all the fluid in your lungs and your eyes into sulfuric acid. So it's very unpleasant. And that was home for us for. Uh, the better part of two weeks. That's where we set up our ropes to go down to the bottom. And there's a drone view. We had a drone with us and we were able to get a, a pretty good view. And you can see at the bottom, there's our campsite. There's a, a few sort of uh, shacks that were built up there for people to come and visit overnight. That series of, uh, of tents over on the right side, that's where, where I was sleeping. And that one little shack down at the very bottom in the middle that was our outhouse, <laughs> and uh, to go and use that outhouse, we had to use a rope to get all the way down there. It's very steep, and when you're done using the outhouse, you had to pull yourself up by rope to get back up to the, the summit there. So it's a very difficult place, very exposed. The weather was so bad most of the time. My tent collapsed in the middle of the night from the wind, just blowing it down. It ripped my tent to shreds. I had to actually get a second tent because um, mine just got completely destroyed from just the wind that n almost never stops up there. But we, we got a little lucky. There wasn't a whole lot of rain. Rain is really a problem for us because then that gas combines with the rain and you get this tremendous acid rain that is it destroys everything. All of our equipment, it burns your skin. It's just nasty. There's a reason why we don't spend a lot of time at these volcanoes because it's really not a good place. There's our campsite. Uh, it was a, a, a team of uh, Canadians, uh, Congolese, we had a guy from England, two people from New Zealand, and uh, some, some people from Japan. So it was this really multi, uh, multinational expedition. And uh, as we were up there, the scientists were doing measurements of how much the volcano was moving. They were taking GPS measurements, uh, seeing if the cracks on the side were getting bigger or smaller. Um, noting the activity of the lava, is it increasing, is it getting more active or less active, these kind of things, and that's what we were helping them with. But at night, oh, it was just so beautiful. You can see our tent there and just the glow from the lava made everything look like, it was, it was like being on another planet. If you've ever seen the movie The Martian, that's kind of what it felt like, being on this orange planet with almost almost no life. There were a few plants and things around, but uh, very much like being on an alien world. A lot of fun. There's the lava lake. You can really see it uh, churning away, and that, that sort of the, uh, the, the, the crater floor there is all made up of old lava flows. The level of the lava will sometimes drop, sometimes it'll raise up. It really does change. And uh, the gas would change drastically. Sometimes there would be a lot of gas. Sometimes there would not be very much at all. And we really had to be very careful in our position because whenever the gas cloud would come over us, even though we had gas masks, it was still very difficult and irritating. And to get down to this point required a really significant rappel of, uh, of on ropes to get down there. It took uh, several hours worth of rappelling to get down. And at night, you can see the, the activity of the lava. It's interesting because when the lava boils up, it forms these fountains, those bright spots. And then these crusts form as the lava cools and they float on the top, kind of like, kind of like cheese on top of a, a French onion soup. And these plates would crash into each other. And you can see the cracks and the light shining through of this really, really hot lava. The temperature of this would be about 1,000 degrees. So getting close to it required special protection, and which you'll see uh, in a few minutes. So really beautiful to see, and all of this is constantly moving. I'll show you a video in a little bit. 
there's Mark and I up at uh, base camp. It was very cold. Uh, surprisingly, <laughs> we're we're in the middle of Africa, very close to the equator. So you would imagine that it would be very hot, and of course, on top of a volcano. But at our campsite, you couldn't feel the heat of the lava because it was too far away down in the bottom of the crater. And we're up at 11,000 feet, like over over 3,500 meters. And up there, it's cold. We were feeling the altitude sickness. Uh, it got down to just a few degrees above freezing every night. So it was uh, a lot colder than you might imagine exploring a volcano in Central Africa, very close to the equator. And we had power with us. We brought a generator up, so we were able to use a satellite uh, communication device to actually try and uh, stay in touch with the outside world, send updates to social media, Twitter and Facebook and things like that. So we were actually uh, sending some live reports from on top of the active volcano. So that was kind of fun. I'd love to do one of these talks from uh, an active volcano like this, but it would be uh, kind of difficult to get that bandwidth uh, happening. But uh, one of these days I'll make it happen. There's some of the other guys in the team just, uh, just <laughs> working on some just so many little details have to go into these expeditions, dealing with paperwork and permissions and all of these things. So it's uh, it gets a bit crazy up there. But eventually we were able to get the rope set up and rappel down to the bottom. We had to do it in three different stages, uh, basically from the summit down to a ledge, from that ledge down to a lower ledge, and then from there down to the very bottom. So it was basically an all-day effort to get from the top down to the bottom and then back up again. Going down is not too difficult. The most dangerous part is not actually the lava itself. It has to, It's more the, the falling rocks. If you're rappelling down and the rope that you're using dislodges a big rock and that rock comes down on top of you or on top of your friend, then you got big trouble. So we're wearing helmets and such and that helps for sure, but uh, that was absolutely the most dangerous thing is the uh, the falling rocks. Gravity was not so much our friend here. And then we finally were able to make it down to about the halfway point. There's Mark uh, relaxing a little bit because it is extremely physically demanding to get down there. But uh, in the end, it's uh, just it's, it's incredible. Down at the bottom, there's almost nothing alive, just rocks that have been thrown there by sporadic volcanic uh, eruptions over the years. And the ultimate prize was to get right up close to the very edge of the lava lake and there that's me <laughs> down at the bottom standing about uh, two steps away from dropping into a giant pool of liquid rock that's a thousand degrees and I tell you it's really interesting if you've ever um, if you've ever turned on the oven or the stove you know that that heat wants to radiate straight up if you put your hand to the side you don't really feel the heat so much but if you put it above you can really feel the heat because that heat wants to rise straight up. And the exact same process happens here. The heat from the lava lake tends to go straight up and not so much over to the side. So if I was standing a few feet further back, I didn't have to wear my protective special uh, metal suit there. But as soon as you walk close to the edge, the heat is unbearable. It's like opening your oven when it's been on full blast. It's really hard to describe how hot this lava actually is. And that suit that I'm wearing is actually the kind of suit that you would wear if you were a worker in a steel mill or a metal foundry or something like that. And uh, it just so happens that they work very well for me when I go close to these uh, volcanoes. They really do protect me from the heat because they reflect that heat back. It's made out of aluminum and it acts uh, kind of like, uh, like tin foil. I kind of felt like the human baked potato while I was down there. And just looking across and seeing just this view that very, very few people uh, would ever, ever get to see. It really is something quite, quite spectacular. Um, and I've got this tradition. Whenever I go to a volcano and I'm doing some type of exploration there, I always take a selfie while I'm down there. <laughs> so this is uh, this sort of extreme volcano selfie standing right beside the lake of lava. I had to be very careful not to take uh, too many steps back. Or uh, it would be, uh, luckily it would be over pretty quick if that were to happen. But uh, all was well. All the team did remain uh, safe and sound. We did very well down there. The uh, the scientists were very happy with the data that we were able to get them. Um, and uh, they've invited us to come back. What I want to show you guys 
is a bit of a video here because it's one thing to talk about this just uh, seeing the still pictures, but it's really it's another thing to see a little video clip. So let me see, make sure this works. Oh. I'm not sure if you guys can hear the sound from this. Yeah, it's playing through. You can? So this is the city of Goma. So it's the job of the people at the Volcano Observatory to keep these people safe. Here we are with our protection, our people helping us to keep us safe in the in the national park. On the six hour hike, this trek up the old lava flows. These guys were super helpful. And this was home for us for two weeks. Setting up the ropes. It's a long way down. Standing at the edge there. Amazing. And there you see, there you go. That's uh, let me just switch this back. Oop, there we go. So an absolutely stunning place. Uh, a couple of quick little facts before I uh, start taking some questions from you guys. The volcano itself is formed in a spot where the uh, the continent of Africa is actually splitting apart very 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 slowly. It's called the the East African Rift Zone. So eventually tens or maybe even hundreds of millions of years from now, Africa will be completely split in half, basically. And we're seeing some of the evidence of that right now because of these uh, volcanoes. They're, they're forming in that spot where the, the two tectonic plates are spreading apart. So it's a really interesting part geologically of the world. And I just found out a few days ago that the activity at the volcano has started to change. Not only is there a lake of lava at the bottom, but now a new vent has opened up at the bottom off to the side and it's spewing out this lava constantly now. It's forming these lava flows that are now pouring across the crater floor and overflowing and actually forming this lava waterfall pouring into the lake of lava. So we don't know what that means yet, whether uh, the volcano is going into a new phase of activity that might threaten the city of Goma. We don't know yet, but right now... Uh, certainly, my friends and colleagues there over at the Volcano Observatory are watching it very, very closely because it could become a threat. So it's very interesting how we were down there just before this lava started pouring across the spot where I was actually standing. The rock that I was standing on is now buried under a layer of new lava now, just from a few days ago. Really interesting. All right, George, that was awesome. Another 
phenomenal presentation. I never get tired of watching your adventures. <laughs> you haven't seen that one, have you? No, that's new. That's awesome. Amazing. <laughs> There's always something new. Yeah. Um, and I really liked the beginning how you talked about your specialty. You're able to say, not many people can say, oh, yeah, going into volcanoes, that's my specialty. No big deal. <laughs> it's one of cool. my specialties, yeah. Pretty cool. All right. Um, well, um, our class from Weatherford, they had to duck out for lunch just after the video. Okay. But let's talk to our class. Actually, Ms. McMahon's class, I know you can hear and see. If you want to send questions via the, the blue chat bar, please feel free, or you can email them to me, and we'll get those in for sure. But uh, let's visit Mrs. Cassidy's group in Deseronto. Okay. Grade 3, 4, and 5, 6, do you have any questions? Skylar, do you have a question? Come on up. I no. Is it for George? Yeah. Okay. Come on up. What is it like down in the Crystal Caves? Oh, the Crystal Caves. Ah, so you guys are familiar with some of my other work. <laughs> I like that. Um, the Crystal Cave that he's referring to is this place in Mexico. Let me pull up a quick picture for you guys so you can see. Um, <laughs> It's a place called Nica. Hold on. A place where uh, I was a few years ago, and there we go. Let me just pull up one quick picture here, and I'll share this so you guys can see it. There we go. You guys see that? So it's a it's a cave that's deep uh, underneath uh, the ground in Mexico that was formed by volcanic activity and it really is like being on another planet. There's these giant crystals of um, of gypsum, which is the same material that makes up your the drywall in your house, and the air temperature in there is about 52 Celsius with almost 100% uh, humidity. So the suit that I'm wearing is a special suit filled with ice, and that helped to keep me cool. So. This place was almost as hot as being in the volcano, a really uh, incredible spot. Maybe what I'll do at some point. Can you try that screen oh, share again, George? Yeah, sorry, sorry. I see what I did wrong. It's okay. There we go. And now you should be able to see. There you go. Can you see that? Yeah. There we go. Wow. So it, it was just an amazing, amazing place. Like the crystals are so big that you can climb over top of them. And Joe, what I might do one of these days is do an entire presentation just on this place because it really is worthwhile. It's just, it's amazing. That would be awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it's one of my favorite places in the world. When I'm not exploring volcanoes, I frequently explore caves. And, uh, oops, there we go. And that's my favorite cave in the whole world for sure. Yeah. And it is like being on another planet. You've got the heat of the Sahara Desert combined with the humidity of the Amazon jungle at the same time. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Mrs. Cassidy's group, if you have another question. Right. <laughs> How many caves have you been in? Oh, I've lost count. <laughs> I don't know how many caves I've been in, but I've been to caves in uh, Madagascar, uh, Mexico, Canada, the U.S., Costa Rica, uh, <laughs> all over the world. Lots of places. Thank you. Thank you. My explorations have taken me to every single continent, including Antarctica a few times, and about 60 different countries. Okay, Emma has a question here. Go yes. ahead. Have you ever been to Yellowstone? Yes, I've been to Yellowstone. That's a, it's a wonderful spot. It's a giant super volcano in uh, the central sort of United States. It's uh, in Wyoming and, and Idaho, and it's this massive, massive volcano that had a huge eruption about 650,000 years ago. And it's the type of volcano that when it does explode, it is such a huge eruption that it could actually affect or even potentially wipe out life on Earth as we know it. So it's the kind of volcano that scientists are very keeping a very, very close eye on. But you can go visit it. It's a national park. It has beautiful geysers. Um, mud pools. It's one of the most beautiful places I've ever visited as long as it doesn't have a big explosion. <laughs> but yes, absolutely. If you get the opportunity to go there, go. Uh, I, I've been there and I loved it. Thank you. Oh, we have another one here, if that's okay. Oh, yes, yeah, of course. How many, of, how many other places have you explored in Canada? In Canada? 
Yeah. Uh, I've I've been to every single province, every single territory. I've driven my car from Toronto to on top of the Arctic Ocean. Been to Baffin Island. Been to coast to coast to coast to coast. Uh, I love Canada. We have such a tremendous, vast, and and diverse geography here. So I, I absolutely love exploring Canada. Thank you, Jay. Um, how many natural disasters have you been to? Uh, how many natural disasters? Well, uh, all different kinds. I, I specialize in documenting extreme forces of nature, so I've seen a lot of volcano eruptions. I've seen, I've been in about 18 hurricanes, including Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Sandy, tornado chasing for the past 18 years or so. I've probably seen about 100 or so tornadoes. Um, avalanches, blizzards, I can't even count. I can't imagine how many. <laughs> I haven't even uh, tried to put a number together in my in my brain, but pretty much everything except earthquakes. I've never really experienced a big earthquake, mainly because you can't predict them. It's impossible to try and go to a place just before a big earthquake happens because we never know when they're going to happen. Our science is not quite there yet. The prediction of earthquakes is not quite there. That's that's the big uh, goal for geologists these days, is trying to figure out a good way to predict earthquakes. And the science just isn't quite there yet. All right. Well, I have a couple questions that have been sent in from um, our group joining us um, from above Lake Superior. So good. We have, I'm glad you guys could at least hear us. Woohoo! Yeah. So we have the first one is, why do you like doing what you do? So I assume they're asking going to the volcanoes, what is it about it that uh, that draws you in? Yeah, I mean, uh, I love exploration and travel and the natural world. I love science and adventure, and I've found a way to combine all of those things together and, and make a living at it, which is great. I've got the best job in the world. I get to go to the most incredible places that very few people will get the opportunity to go see because it's too difficult or because it's too dangerous. So there's not that many people in the world that that do what I do because it is difficult and dangerous and it's just I've, I've been drawn to it I just I love it and I started off very small just doing a few things chasing chasing storms locally here in Toronto and and then just doing a little bit more and a little bit more and every year it would expand and expand some more and just just kept snowballing and when I was growing up my two big heroes were ocean explorer Jacques Cousteau and Indiana Jones so I sort of combined those two influences and my love of, of science and nature and travel and adventure and and here I am today very cool it's worked out pretty well so far I'd say and I love sharing the stories awesome um, so they have another question here um, what was your favorite trip? So maybe we can answer this two ways. Can you maybe of the four lakes you visited so far, which yeah. one kind of stood out the most? And maybe a second way, um, which maybe another expedition outside of volcanoes that's really stood out? Yeah. Um, well, in terms of volcanoes, it was really great being able to go to Niragongo because I was there 10 years ago and never got the chance to go down to the bottom. So. Uh, the desire to go to the very bottom has been stuck in my brain for 10 years, sort of just like a hamster wheel, just grinding away at my brain and finally getting the chance to go there and do it properly was very rewarding for me. Um, the one volcano I haven't been to yet that I really want to go to is Mount Erebus in Antarctica. It's the fifth spot where there's lakes of lava that I have not been to yet. So hopefully at some point in the next couple of years I'll be able to do that. It's very difficult. But in terms of non-volcanoes, uh, expeditions. The Crystal Cave that I talked about uh, is probably my my one of my favorite places because it is so odd. So few people get to go there. I also did an expedition for National Geographic about two years ago, where I went to Turkmenistan and went down inside a flaming crater of natural gas <laughs> out in the desert, which was also one of the most amazing things I've ever done. So it's really hard to pick which is my favorite or the best or whatever, because there's just so many, but those are a few examples. And each one of those could be an entire presentation here uh, one of these days. All right. Well, we'll keep you busy doing these presentations as, as long as you're happy doing them. <laughs> Um, I've got a question here on the event page. So you'd said earlier that there were um, five spots, and so you yes. mentioned obviously in the Congo, and then you talked about the one 
on Antarctica. Where are the other spots? Yeah, so lava lakes are very rare. So the only places where you can where you get permanent lava lakes is uh, Hawaii, um, the Congo, the little um, island nation of Vanuatu in the South Pacific, which I've been to numerous times, uh, Ethiopia. There's one in the Ethiopian desert and uh, Mount Erebus in Antarctica. You can get temporary ones in different places. Right now, today, there's one in Nicaragua, but I don't know how long it's going to last for. So maybe I should take a quick trip to Nicaragua before it goes away, because I like to visit them all. <laughs> but uh, that's that's the that's the top five basically, where they're basically more or less permanent. All right, George, I'm just pulling up something really quick here. Mm -hmm. um, let me see how quick I can find it. I want to share this with the classrooms just in case. Um, they haven't saw it before. You mentioned uh, Vanuatu, where you visited, and yes, I don't know if, if, if the classrooms know this, but George was very nice enough to form a, uh, to film a little promo for us um, from oh, inside yes. of that crater. So I'm just going to share my screen. I'm going to share that now, just in case you haven't seen that before, and uh, you'll see George in his suit, and he's pretty close to the action. <laughs> so I'm going to share this really quickly. I'll just share my screen. All right, there we go. All right. There we go. I'm explorer and adventurer George Karunas. And when I explore, I do it by the seat of my pants. Huh. I imagine it was pretty warm down there. It was. That particular volcano was um, on Ambram Island in Vanuatu, a place called Benbo. That's the name of that particular crater. There's there's several craters on that island that have lava lakes. And there's there's three there. I've been to two. I've, actually, I've seen all three, but I've descended down to two of the three. So I still have a few check, mark, check boxes on my, my bucket list that I still have to do. Yeah. And this might be an interesting fact for the students um, about where you were married. Yes. Um, also in the country of Vanuatu, my uh, my wife Michelle and I, we got married uh, nine years ago on the crater's edge of a volcano called Yasser that was exploding as our wedding ceremony was happening. So we were exchanging our vows and there were pieces of lava flying hundreds of meters through the air during the ceremony. It was pretty amazing. All right. Well, George, Let's uh, visit our class, Mrs. Cassidy's group, one more time. Maybe they have a question or two to wrap us up for today. Let's do that. All right. Thanks for all the information. Cool. Hopefully Thank you. See you again. Yes. So, were there any more? Yes, we just want to say thank you, George, for everything. It was great, and we learned a lot. And it was. We hope to see you again. Well, thank you. As a matter of fact, check this out. The, the video that you guys saw today of this particular volcano is a preview that's going to end up on the Weather Network. So you guys got to see this video before it actually made it to broadcast. So it was a bit of a sneak peek uh, for you guys before the rest of the world gets to see it. All right. Well, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thanks. Yay! Bye. Awesome. Well, George, thanks so much for today. And thanks to our three classes who were able to join in. And I think you brought a little warmth to the cold day that we have here in Ontario. So that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and um, yeah, really look forward to connecting again as your adventures continue. And actually, maybe just on that topic as we wrap up, what's next on the horizon? Uh, I'm, I'm back home. I just got <laughs> between the Congo and now, I was on other expeditions in Guatemala and Brazil. Um, and now I'm back home for a couple of weeks, and then in uh, April I go to Hawaii to go to Kilauea Volcano, and then it'll be tornado chasing in May. All right. Sounds like uh, an exciting schedule, and uh, yeah, enjoy your downtime. It sounds like it's well, well deserved. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, everyone, for today, and uh, thank you, George, and we're signing off.